Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Because it's almost midday, which means PMQs is on its way. That's Big Ben. A very foggy Ooh. London today. Uh, but Laura Kunzberg has made it through the fog. I have. Are we um, going to return to Europe today I... with Mr Corbyn? Well, as ever. It's always a bit dangerous to be too sure about it. But I think it would be pretty surprising. Look, this is so much the subject, mm. not just of the week and mm. the thing that everybody's been talking about really since the new year, but absolutely of the moment with Labour and some Tory rebels, we call them now, rebel mm. remainers, um, pushing for once at the same thing, both of them pushing at this idea of forcing the government to come up with a white paper, a document in terms of presenting mm. more formally their plans for the Brexit negotiations. So it may be that Mr Corbyn decides to use some of his questions to go on that. However, worth suggesting he may also pick up on the rough sleeping statistics on homelessness that are out this morning. We know Jeremy Corbyn has many times mm. raised the issue of housing and those figures this morning show a pretty big rise. That might be something he chooses to mention. Is this uh, line, and we've heard it several times now, that we don't want a bargain basement mm. Britain mm. Uh, if uh, we don't want rights to be uh, uh, curtailed. We don't want to go kind of tax haven way. Is that is that a line that he might pursue? Indeed, I think they're trying to make that stick. I mean, mm. in terms of a critique of the government's plan for Brexit, um, that is something that given that Labour disagrees internally mm. on lots of the facets of all of this, that is a message that most Labour MPs can unite around. They can say that we don't want the country to go in a direction that they're not happy mm. with. We don't want workers' rights to be exploited. We know, again, that's something that Jeremy Corbyn has picked out again and again but the, uh, in terms uh, of Brexit. Paul, Paul, uh, Blomfield, the, uh, Sadiq Khan, the Labour mayor of London, uh, he has said, he said, I, I've spoken to a number of people, who've, including Francis O'Grady, who've been dealing with the government. I've spoken to them as well. And he says, I don't think they want to weaken workers' rights. I've seen no evidence from the conversation I've had with senior members of the government that that's their aspiration or their intention or something they want to do. Well, that's indeed what they've said. Um, and so I think it's probably for Brandon or others to answer, what did they mean then by that threat uh, when Philip Hammond made his point and Theresa May echoed it in her speech last week? The but different economic and social model, what does that mean? But Sadiq Khan would not say this unless he believed it to be true. Well, we aim to hold the government to account on the pledge which David Davis made again yesterday, that they don't want to weaken workers' rights. Mm. So what does that threaten of a change in our economic model mean? How are they using the British people as bargaining chip? What's, it, what's that about? Maybe Brandon can answer. It's not a very helpful quote from Sadiq Khan. It's not a very helpful quote from Sadiq Khan, nor is what one government minister said to me yesterday that actually in the department they were talking about, they were looking actually to be more progressive and actually entrench rights in their particular part of government than actually currently under the EU legislation. But I think this goes to the fact that actually while Brexit is, if you like, a menu without prices. It's very difficult for Labour to be able to be clear mm. and fill it really away at the government's plans when so many of them are question marks. You know, it's sort of rhetoric attacking rhetoric rather than rhetoric going after a reality. What's, what are the chances the government whips out a white paper from its handbag in the next couple of weeks? Well, I think it's not impossible. And I think <laughs> that ministers I've talked to in the last day are very happy to have this up their sleeve. However, there has been a debate about whether or not they should do it now. It would be an unplanned defeat, if you like, an unplanned concession when they felt really very chipper last night in the wake of mm. the legal ruling. But it's not impossible that they'll go, oh, look, here you are. Here's one I made earlier. And, Don't, I think and they probably did matter. make it. Isn't it just a cut and paste job of well, Theresa May's speech for the, the odd footnote? Indeed. And this tells <laughs> you, you better how hold much that is thought, Laura. Process. We've got to go straight over to PMQs. We'll return to this. The though. Speaker of the Clutor, the Burmese Parliament and he is accompanied by a delegation of his parliamentary colleagues. I'm sure the House will wish to join me in welcoming Mr Speaker and his colleagues. Order. Questions to the Prime Minister. Helen Jones. Number one, sir. 
The Prime Minister. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And I think, as the response from the whole House showed, we all do indeed welcome the Speaker of the Burmese Parliament and his colleagues to see our uh, deliberations today. Uh, I'm also sure that the whole House will join me in sending our thoughts to the police officer who was shot in Belfast over the weekend and to his friends and family. PSNI do a superb job in keeping us safe and secure, and they have our fullest support. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. And later this week, I will travel to the United States for talks with President Trump. May I join the Prime Minister in sending good wishes to the police officer who was shot in Belfast? They are the best drivers of social mobility. 99% are rated good or outstanding, and 65% of their places are in the most deprived areas of this country. So why is the Prime Minister introducing cuts that threaten the very existence of maintained nursery schools? Is it not true that when it comes to social mobility, her actions speak far louder than her words. Yeah. Prime Minister! I want to ensure, and this government wants to ensure, that we see good quality of education at every age and every, uh, at every stage for children in this country. That is, why we are looking at, that is why we are looking at improving the number of good school places. But she talks about my record speaking louder than words. Can I just point out to the Honourable Lady that I was very proud as Chairman of an Education Authority in London in the 1990s to introduce nursery school places for every three- and four-year-old whose parent wanted them. Yeah. Phil. Yeah. The, the Prime Minister laid out a clear and bold plan for Brexit in her speech last week. Honourable, hon, honourable members, honourable members, quite rightly want an opportunity to scrutinise that plan. Does the Prime Minister agree that the best way of facilitating that scrutiny would be a government white paper laying out our vision for a global Britain based on free trade in goods and services that will be to the benefit of us and other European countries? Prime Minister! My honourable friend raises the question of parliamentary scrutiny. I have been clear, as have senior ministers, that we will ensure that Parliament has every opportunity to provide that scrutiny on this issue as we go through this process. But I recognise I set out that bold plan for a global Britain last week, and I recognise there is an appetite in this House to see that plan set out in a white paper. My honourable friend's question, the question from my honourable friend, the member from Broxtow, last week, uh, on the same vein. And I can confirm to the House that our plan will be set out in a white paper published in this House. Just well, that's a climb down and a U-turn, but a almost, guy, I haven't, I, yeah, almost, almost. Okay, James. yeah, because I was going to say I haven't seen tomorrow's Daily Mail yet, so I don't know why it's a wonderful blow for I, democracy. I, I, I'll come on to it. just to explain the quick difference between what uh, the original proposal yes. was, which actually, as I'll explain, still stands for a one-line bill saying. Does the House of Commons uh, support uh, Theresa May uh, triggering Article yes. uh, 50 versus a white paper where the government uh, would be forced to actually detail what they wanted to achieve uh, from leaving the European Union after uh, 2019? Uh, so that's the, the feeling is that within the government is that to do that would provide too many details or you could risk providing too many details going into a negotiation which at best is going to be very, very difficult uh, when you're facing the likes of Michel Barnier and Guy Verhofstadt mm -hmm. over on the other side. So they want to avoid that. So then Jeremy Corbyn asked the Prime Minister, not once but twice, when Theresa May would publish this white paper. He doesn't paper. normally do that, does he? He doesn't normally double up. No, he, he managed to do it successfully. Okay. Uh, he had a good start to PMQ's le less, <laughs> less great. <laughs> <opinion. laughs> Mr Speaker, I join the Prime Minister. I join the Prime Minister in condolences to the... And expressing condolences, I'm sure, of the whole House to the family of the police officer who lost his life over the weekend in Northern Ireland. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister has um, wasted 80 days between the time of the original judgment and the appeal and has now finally admitted today, after pressure from all sides, that there's going to be a white paper. Could we know when this white paper is going to be available to us? And why, and why 
it's taken so long to get it. Prime Minister! Can I, can I say to the right honourable gentleman, he asked for debates. I was very clear there would always be debates in this House, and there have been and will continue to be. He asked for votes. There have been votes in this House. The House voted overwhelmingly for the Government to trigger Article 50 before the end of March this year. Uh, he asked for a plan. I set out, as my honourable friend for Croydon South said, a clear plan for a bold future for Britain. He, asked for, he and others asked for a white paper. I've been clear there will be a white paper. But what I'm also clear about is that the right honourable gentleman always asks about process, about the means to the end. I and this government are focusing on the outcomes. We're focusing, we're focusing on a truly global Britain, building a stronger future for this country, the right deal for Britain and Britain out of the European Union. Mr Speaker, my question wasn't complicated. It just asked when the white paper will come out and will it be, will it be published before or at the same time as the bill that is apparently about to be published. Mr Speaker, last week I asked the Prime Minister repeatedly to clarify whether her government is prepared to pay to secure tariff-free access to the single European market. She repeatedly refused to answer the question. So I'll ask her again. Is her government ruling out paying a fee for tariff-free access to the single market or the bespoke customs union that she outlined also in her speech? But at the second time of asking, Theresa May gave this answer. And as I said, it wasn't perhaps the one that Remainers were looking for. Prime Minister. Can I first of all say to the right honourable gentleman in his reference to the, uh, to the timing issue, these are actually two separate issues. The House has overwhelmingly voted that Article 50 should be triggered before the end of March 2017. Following the Supreme Court judgment, a bill will be provided for this House and there will be the proper debates in this chamber and in another place on that, uh, on that bill. There is then the separate question of actually publishing the plan that I have set out, a bold vision for Britain for the future. I will do that in a white paper, and the right honourable gentleman knows that one of our objectives is the best possible free trade arrangement with the European Union, and that's what we'll be out there negotiating for. So what Theresa May is saying is she's splitting the issue. So the vote, we're still going to have the straightforward and simple uh, bill that David Davis, the Brexit Secretary, pr promised yesterday. And that, for the government, minimises, James, uh, the risks of uh, having to provide too much detail and the risk of amendments. And it depends what the timetable that the Speaker, John Burko, allows for that uh, allows for that vote. But they're trying to squeeze it so there's not too much debate. And then you have the white paper. But Theresa May didn't say when that white paper is going to come. But obviously, from listening to what she said there, it, 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 there is a time frame where it could appear post triggering Article 50 at the end of March, and that would provide uh, the government with much more leeway and flexibility going into those negotiations. Not surprisingly, Jeremy Corbyn then switched tack onto the idea of a Singapore style economy where workers' rights are diluted. Remember from last week, this is the threat from the Prime Minister if we don't get the deal that we want uh, from uh, the European Union uh, leaders going into those negotiations. If we don't get that, we're going to create this sort of offshore tax havens on the outskirts of Europe to get uh, and try and undercut with a low rate of corporation tax and then remodel our economy, uh, as I said, to Singapore. Uh, and of course, uh, this is uh, an issue that uh, Jeremy Corbyn. Briefly, Theo Ashwood, what, what does that mean? I, I mean, I know you just explained a little, but, but uh, Singapore is a place that ad attracts businesses by writing by rolling out a red carpet metaphorically what does it mean what really? they're talking about essentially is remodeling the british economy so you have low rates of tax both presumably personal and certainly corporation tax uh, and so that encourages businesses to invest but of course because your rates of tax are so low uh, then there are big question marks. Labour are saying when it comes to the NHS, when it comes right. to the welfare state. How, can you, how do how we you pay fund for all this stuff? Exactly. How do you pay for that? So it goes hand in hand with this sort of but, resurgent 
But what that enables, what that enables uh, Labour to do is to unite, because of course Jeremy Corbyn has been pro-Brexit, uh, and as to much to the chagrin of his uh, more moderate backbenches, pro-European backbenches, but it, it provides a, if you like, a congealing uh, effect for the Labour Party when it comes to dealing with uh, the thorny issue of Europe, which divides them just as much as it, perhaps more than it mm. divides uh, the Tories. Uh, this was uh, Jeremy Corbyn's question. Well, some of this is very worrying to many people in this House, but more importantly, it's worrying to many others. For example, the chief executive of Nissan was given assurances by her business secretary about future trade arrangements with Europe, but now says they will have to re-evaluate the situation about their investments in Britain. The Prime Minister, Mr Speaker, is threatening the EU that unless they give in to her demands, she will turn Britain into a bargain basement tax haven off the coast of Europe. Well, Mr Speaker, we on this side of the House are very well aware of the consequences that would have, the damage it would do to jobs and living standards and our public services. Is she now going to rule out the bargain basement threat that was in her speech at Lancaster House? Now, the only problem for Jeremy Corbyn is that Sadiq Khan was appearing in front of the London Assembly uh, this morning when he was asked about Brexit and London's plans for Brexit and backed the government, David Davis, the Brexit Secretary, instead of his own Labour leader. I know that the government, for example, David Davis has met with Francis O'Grady from the TUC. Uh, a number of people who care about workers' uh, rights. Uh, I think, again, to give credit to the government, I don't think they want to uh, weaken workers' rights. Uh, and I'm hoping that what we have now is a floor, not a ceiling. Uh, none of us want to see a dilution of workers' rights in a race to the bottom. And that's why there's been some anxiety with comments made about uh, us being, uh, uh, inverted commas, an offshore tax haven, because the implication is that would lead to a dilution of uh, workers' rights. I've seen no evidence from the conversations I've had with senior members of government. That's their aspiration, their intention, or, or what they want to do, uh, which is good. Uh, Sadiq Khan doesn't want to simply turn his mayoralty into being an opposition spokesman. He has to get on with the government. That's why he's making he's a... Polar opposite of Boris, then. Boris would have loved the idea of being the king across the water for the Conservative Party. In fact, you, he, he was in many ways, whereas Sadiq Khan, you believe, wants to actually do London stuff for London. And he wants to get on with the government, and yeah. there's been too much... There's a well, you, can't, you, can't, you can't be a, an effective mayor of London without getting on with the government. Exactly, and there's been a, a slight feeling within Whitehall, and I think that's been picked up in City Hall as well, that at the moment he sound, he has sounded in the past, in, in recent weeks, as, as a bit of a, 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 a mayor on the other side of the water, you know, throwing his toys out of his pram, pram getting yes. angry and not doing enough to get on with the government, make friends within Whitehall, and then get a best deal for London when it comes to an issue. Say, it's a really interesting Brexit. analysis, that. Um, it's boring politics, but effective. Exactly. But it did provide Theresa May with an easy win yes. to bat Jeremy Corbyn over the head with. Prime Minister! I expect us to get a good deal for trading relationships with the European Union. But what I'm also clear about is that this government will not sign up to a bad deal for the United Kingdom. And as to, as to the threats that the right honourable gentleman claims about what might happen, and he often talks about this, he uses those phrases, he talks about workers' rights. Perhaps he should listen to his former colleague in this House, uh, the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, who has today said, to give credit to the government, I don't think they want to weaken workers' rights, and goes on to say, I've seen no evidence from the conversations I've had with senior members of the government that that's their aspiration or their intention or something they want to do, which is good. As usual with Labour, the right hand's not talking to the far left. Good line. Good line. Good credibility. Poor delivery. <laughs> Credibility points for uh, Sadiq Khan, pitching himself as, as, a, as a sort of centre-left politician. The problem is a lot of backbenchers will be leaning more towards Sadiq Khan's worldview than they are towards Jeremy Corbyn's. Yep. And, um, and it's, a, it, it's going to be a long-running issue. Of course, Sadiq Khan relied on Jeremy Corbyn's supporters, Momentum supporters, to go out and knock doors, deliver leaflets for his campaign. He always tried to keep that, uh, trying to suppress any publicity around that particular uh, support from Momentum, but here, very much the centre politician. Oh, thank goodness we're not living in an era where strong parliamentary opposition would be really, really important. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, 
the evidence of what the Tory party and this government really thinks about workers' rights was there for all to see yesterday. A private member's bill under the 10-minute rule bill by a Tory MP to tear up parts of the International Labour Organisation Convention, talking down my friend the member for Grimsby's bill to protect European workers' rights that have been obtained in this country. That is the real agenda of the Tory party. Mr Speaker, what the Prime Minister is doing is petulantly aiming a threat at our public services with her threats about a bargain basement Britain. Is her priority our struggling NHS, those denied social care, children having their school funding cut, or is it once again further cuts in big business taxation to make the rich even better off? Prime Minister! I would simply remind the right honourable gentleman on the issue of workers' rights that I have been very clear that this government will protect workers' rights. Indeed, we have a review of modern employment law to ensure that employment legislation is keeping up with with the modern labour market. One of the objectives I set out in my plan for our negotiating objectives was to protect workers' rights. But he talks about threats to public services. I'll tell him what the threat to public services would be. It would be a Labour government borrowing £500 million extra pounds. That would would destroy our economy and mean no funding for our public services. Jeremy Corbyn! The threat to workers' rights, Mr Speaker, is there every day. Six million earning less than the living wage. Many people, nearly a million, on zero-hours contracts with no protection being offered by this Government. What they're doing is offering once again the bargain basement alternative. Will the Prime Minister, Mr Speaker, also take this opportunity today to congratulate the 100,000 people who marched in Britain last weekend to highlight women's rights after President Trump's inauguration and express their concerns about his misogyny? Because many have concerns, Mr Speaker, that in her forthcoming meeting with President Trump, she will be prepared to offer up for sacrifice the opportunity of American companies to come in and take over parts of our NHS or our public services. Will she assure the House that in any trade deal, none of those things will be offered up as a bargaining chip? Prime Minister! Again, I would point out to the Right Honourable Gentleman that it is this Government that has introduced the national living wage. And this government that actually made changes to zero hour contracts. But on the issue of my visit to the United States of America, on, my, on the issue of my visit to the United States of America, I'm pleased that I am able to meet President Trump so early in his administration. That is a sign of the strength of the special relationship between the United Kingdom and the United States of America, on spe- a special relationship on which he and I <coughs> intend to build. But can I also say to the uh, Leader of the Opposition, I am not afraid to speak frankly to a President of the United States. I am able to do that because we have that special relationship, a special relationship that he would never have with the United States. Mr Speaker, we would never allow Britain to be sold off on the cheap. How confident is she of getting a good deal for global Britain from a president who wants to put America first, buy American and build a wall between his country and Mexico. Mr. Article 50 wasn't about a court judgment against this government. What it signified was the bad judgment of this government. The bad judgment of prioritising corporate tax cuts over investment in national health and social care. The bad judgment of threatening European partners whilst offering a blank cheque to President Trump. The the bad judgment of wanting to turn Britain into a bargain basement tax haven. So will she offer some clarity and some certainty and withdraw the threats to destroy the social structure of this country by turning us into the bargain basement she clearly threatens? 
Prime Minister! We will be out around the world with the EU, America and other countries negotiating good free trade deals for this country that will bring prosperity to this country. But the right honourable gentleman wants to talk about Brexit. Uh, I have to say to him, he's the leader of the party. He can't even agree with his shadow chancellor about Brexit. The Shadow Chancellor can't agree with the Shadow Brexit Secretary. The Shadow Brexit Secretary disagrees with the Shadow Home Secretary. And the Shadow Home Secretary has to ring up the leader and tell him to change his mind. He talks about us standing up for Britain. They can't speak for themselves. They'll never speak for Britain. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. On the 27th of December, another young woman lost her life driving through the West Country on the A303. In the past decade, more than 1,000 people have been killed or injured on that road. And for 40 years, governments have promised to duel the lethal parts of the road, where two lanes become three and back and two and three. Um, with no central reservation. The queues on the road are also legendary, and I know the government's committed to an upgrade, but can the Prime Minister assure us that the proposed tunnel beneath Stonehenge will not hold up essential work elsewhere and will soon see cones on the road and spades in the ground? Uh, well, my, my honourable friend raises an important issue. He's absolutely right to do that. And uh, I can assure him we are working. Uh, generally to improve the safety of our roads. He refers specifically to the issue of the A303 and the tragic incident that happened on the 27th of December. Uh, we've committed to creating a dual carriageway on the A303 from the M3 to the M5. I understand Highways England have recently launched a consultation into the route under Stonehenge, and my honourable friend will want to look closely at that uh, issue. This is all part of our £2 billion investment in road improvements that will improve connections in the South West, but I can assure him that we have road safety at the forefront of our mind. Angus Robertson. Yeah. Thank you very much. May I uh, begin by wishing everybody a very happy Burns Day and, of course, uh, extending congratulations to the Scotsman newspaper, which is celebrating its bicentenary uh, today. Uh, yester yesterday, uh, the government lost in the Supreme Court, and today we have a very welcome U-turn on a white paper in regards to Brexit. So, in this spirit of progress, for Parliament, in advance of meeting President Trump, will the Prime Minister tell Parliament what she wants to achieve in a UK-US trade deal? Yeah. 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 Prime Minister, well, first of all, can I join the Right Honourable Gentleman in uh, his good wishes for a happy Burns Day to uh, everybody, and also in recognising the bicentenary of the Scotsman? Uh, and uh, I'm sure everybody in the House would join me in that. What do we want to achieve in terms of our arrangements with the United States? Well, it's very simple. We want to achieve an arrangement that ensures that the interests of the United Kingdom are there, that are put first, and that's what I will be doing, and that we see a, a trade arrangements with the United States, as we will be looking for with other parts of the world, that can increase our trade, bring prosperity, bring growth to the United Kingdom. And then my aim for this government is to ensure that that economy works for everyone in every part of the United Kingdom. Angus Robertson. The European Union, which we're still part of, has amongst the highest food safety standards anywhere in the world, and we are proud on our continent to have public national health systems. The United States, on the other hand, is keen to have health systems which are fully open to private competition. They want to export genetically modified organisms, beef raised with growth hormones, and chicken meat washed with chlorinated water. Will the Prime Minister tell President Trump that she is not prepared to lower our food and safety standards or to open health systems for privatisation? Or does she believe that this is a price worth paying for a UK-US trade deal? Prime Minister! We will be looking for a UK-US trade deal that improves trade between the our two countries, that will bring prosperity and growth to this country, that will ensure that we can bring jobs to this country as well. And I can assure the right honourable gentleman that in doing that, we will put UK interests and UK values first. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Historic per capita spending in our regions, including Yorkshire, when compared to London, is up to 40% lower for our local authorities, up to 50% lower for our schools, and up to 60% lower for our transport projects. 
Does the Prime Minister agree that if we want to build a country that works for everyone, we need a fair funding deal that works for everyone? Yeah. Prime Minister. I the, uh, the issues that my honourable friend has raised, and I can assure him that our commitment in relation to uh, the uh, northern, northern parts of uh, England, including uh, Yorkshire, is absolutely clear. We want to back business growth right across the north. We are backing the northern powerhouse um, to help the great cities and towns of the north pool their strengths and take on the world. Yorkshire LEPs have received an additional £156 million in government funding this week, and we're spending a record £13 billion on transport across the north. And as a result, there are more people in work in Yorkshire and the Humber than ever before, and the employment rate is at a record high. That's good news for people in the region and good news for our economy as a whole. Yeah. Dr Philippa yeah. Whitford. Yeah. Thank, you very, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The European Medicines Agency provides a single drug licensing system for 500 million people and results in the UK having drugs licensed 6 to 12 months ahead of countries like Canada and Australia. Yesterday, the Health Secretary stated that the UK will not be in the EMA. So can the Prime Minister confirm this and explain how she'll prevent delayed drug access for UK patients? Yeah. Well, Minister. There, are number, there are a number of organisations that we are part of as members of the European Union. And as part of the work that we are doing to uh, look at the United Kingdom in the future when we've left the European Union, we look at the arrangements that we can put in place uh, in relation to those, uh, to those issues. We want to ensure that we continue to have the pharmaceutical industry in this country is a very important uh, part of our economy, uh, as are the ability of people to access these new drugs. And I can assure the Honourable Lady that we are looking seriously at this and will ensure we've got the arrangements that we need. Kit Malthouse. Mr Speaker, too few British entrepreneurs are connecting with the capital they need to start and grow. As part of her industrial strategy, which will be looking at access to capital, will the Prime Minister order a review of the Enterprise Investment Scheme and the Seed Enterprise Investment Scheme in the hope that they can be simplified, helping to create the large pools of buccaneering capital that British industry needs? Yeah. Well, like Prime my, my, hon my honourable friend raises an important issue, and he's He's long been a champion of entrepreneurship in this, uh, in this country. And I can tell him that in the industrial strategy, we are committed to providing the best the best environment for business. The Treasury has established a patient capital review, for example, that's uh, chaired by, uh, there's a panel chaired by Sir Damon Buffini that's looking at the barriers that exist to long term investment. And we're also increasing investment in venture capital by the British Business Bank by £400 million, and that will unlock £1 billion of new finance. And the Treasury is going to be publishing a consultation in the spring examining these issues, and I'm sure my honourable friend will wish to contribute and respond to that. Lillian Greenwood. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Four and a half years ago, my constituents, Chris and Lydia Leake, were on a family holiday on the Greek island of Zante when their son Jamie was hit and killed by a speeding motorbike. It was his ninth birthday. The rider was convicted but has appealed against his sentence and to date remains a free man. Will the Prime Minister agree to meet with Chris and Lydia to discuss how they can finally secure justice for Jamie. Yeah. Can I, I say to the uh, Honourable Lady, I'm very happy to look at this case. I mean, it's a tragic case that she has described, and our thoughts must be with Chris and Lydia at the terrible loss that they, that they uh, experienced. Um, uh, as to the issues of how, what is happening in terms of the Greek criminal justice system, of course, that is a matter for the Greek authorities. Um, but we will, I will look seriously at this case and see if there's anything that the Foreign Office can do in relation to this. President Trump has repeatedly said that he will bring back torture as an instrument of policy. When she sees him on Friday, will the Prime Minister make clear that in no circumstances will she permit Britain to be dragged into facilitating that torture as we were after September the 11th? I, I can Minister. assure my honourable friend that we have a very clear position on torture. We do not sanction torture. We do not get involved with that, and that will continue to be our position. Andy Slaughter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 70 per cent of my constituents voted Remain. 15 per cent are citizens of other U EU countries, and almost all don't trust her government to negotiate a deal that secures the future prosperity of London and the UK. Will she give this House a veto on the deal she does, or will she put that deal back 
to a referendum of the British people. Prime Minister. Honourable gentlemen. There, people voted differently across the country. There are parts of the country that voted to remain. There are parts of the country that voted to leave. What we now do is unite behind the result of the vote that took place. We come together as a country, we go out there, we make a success of this, and we ensure that we build that truly global Britain that will bring jobs to his constituency and for his constituents. William Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This week, Milton Keynes celebrates its 50th birthday. We have been the most successful of new cities and have one of the highest rates of economic growth. Will the Prime Minister agree that Milton Keynes has a great future and will be central to delivering this government's ambitions? Prime Minister! Well, can I, can I join my hon. Friend, can I join my hon. Friend in, make, in uh, marking Milton Keynes' 50th birthday? And also, I understand he secured a Westminster Hall debate later today on this subject and congratulate him on having done that. And I think that Milton Keynes is a great example of what you can achieve with a clear plan and with strong local leadership. Uh, we're providing, as he knows, additional funding for the East-West Rail project. I know he supported that through chairing its APPG, uh, as well as for the Oxford to Cambridge Expressway Road Scheme. And we'll see a country that works for everyone. Milton Keynes has uh, had not just a great 50 years, but I'm sure will have a great future as well. Kelvin Hopkins. Oh, Mr. Speaker, um, last week a freight train arrived at Barking from China using the Channel mm. Tunnel and demonstrating the massive potential of rail freight. But continental rail wagons and lorry trailers on trains cannot be accommodated on Britain's historic rail network because its loading gauge is too small. Would the Prime Minister therefore consider giving positive support to the GB freight route scheme, which will provide a large gauge freight line linking all the nations and regions of Britain, both to each other and to Europe and Asia beyond, and would take five million lorry journeys off Britain's roads every year? The Minister. Uh, the, the Honourable Gentleman has raised an issue, which is the different uh, gauge on railways here and on the continent, which has been obviously an issue for uh, uh, some considerable time. Uh, we want to, to encourage freight on rail. We have been encouraging uh, freight on whale and we will continue to do so. Rebecca Powell. Yeah. 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 Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The Ministry of Cake in my constituency <laughs> of Taunton Dean, a £30 million turnover company, has recently been bought by a French company called Mademoiselle Desserts. Yeah. <laughs> they trade across Europe at the Ministry of Cake and into China. Does this not demonstrate, Prime Minister, and would you agree with me, that it demonstrates confidence in our economy and that a European company has bought into it? it it demonstrates that we can unlock global trade and it demonstrates that the South West is a terrific place to do business. I absolutely agree with my honourable friend. I think the investment that she has referred to of the French company into a company in her constituency shows the confidence that people have in our economy for the future. It shows the fundamental strengths of our economy, and it also shows, as she says, that we can unlock global trade. And of course, the South West is a very good place to do business. Peter Grant. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Robert Burns once wrote, Whatever damages society or any least part of it, that is my measure of iniquity. Would the Prime Minister agree that that description applies perfectly to the detention fast track system recently found to be illegal by British courts, under which 10,000 asylum seekers were denied a fair trial, and some of whom were probably illegally deported to death and torture? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister! Well, I say to the Honourable Gentleman, the issue of the detained fast track system uh, in the asylum system is one that obviously I looked at when I was Home Secretary, and we did make a number of changes to the way we operated the detained fast track. But it's built on a very simple um, uh, principle, which is that if there is somebody who, uh, uh, whose case for asylum is such that they are almost certain to be refused that asylum, then we want to ensure that they can be removed from the country as quickly as possible, hence the detained fast track. David Morris. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I would like to ask my friend the Prime Minister if she would assist in trying to get an enterprise zone in my constituency of Morecambe and Loonsdale as part of industrial strategy because it turns out that the Labour Council and the Labour County Council who are talking about a enterprise zone-esque project in the area have not even applied for any funding whatsoever so would my right honourable friend please assist me in this endeavour. Prime Minister! Well, can I say to my honourable friend I know what a champion for Morecambe and Loonsdale he is and has been 
Member of Parliament. Um, and I'm sure that the, uh, the Chancellor and the Business Secretary will look at the issue that he has raised. But I also say how sad it is that Labour councils are not willing to put forward proposals to increase the prosperity and economic growth in their area. Order. Closed question, Mr. Patrick Grady. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question 11. Well done. I will meet the uh, First Minister and leaders of the devolved administrations at the Joint Ministerial Committee on Monday, but of course we regularly engage with the Scottish Government on a wide range of issues. Trick Grady. Thank you, Mr Speaker. When she does eventually meet with the First Minister, will she confirm whether uh, she, the Prime Minister, supports the principle in the Scotland Act that whatever is not reserved is devolved, and will she therefore be able to tell the First Minister what powers will come to the Scottish Parliament in the event of Brexit? Yeah, and can yeah. she confirm that the Great Repeal Bill will not be the Great Power Grab? Yeah. Prime Minister! I have been very clear, I think this was echoed yesterday by my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State, for exiting the European Union, uh, that powers that are, no powers that are currently devolved are going to be suddenly taken back to the United Kingdom Government. What we will be looking at and what we will be discussing with the devolved administrations is how we deal with those powers which are currently in Brussels when they come back to the United Kingdom and what we want to ensure what we want to ensure that those powers are dealt with so that we can maintain the important single market of the United Kingdom. Oliver Dowden. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It is currently an offence to assault a police officer, an immigration officer or a prison officer, but it is not a specific offence to assault an NHS worker, whether they are a doctor, a nurse or a paramedic. Does my Prime Minister agree with me we should consider extending a specific offence to these people to make it absolutely clear that the public will not tolerate violence towards our hard-working members of the NHS? Prime Minister! My honourable friend raises an important point. Of course, we condemn assaults on anybody uh, and any violence that takes place, uh, but the Secretary of State for Health has heard the uh, case that he has put and uh, will be happy to look at that particular issue that he's raised. Chris Bryant. Uh, when she introduces a UK agricultural policy, because we're out of the common agricultural policy, will the Duke of Westminster still receive £407,000 a year? Will the Duke of Northumberland still receive £475,000 a year? And will the Earl of Ivor still receive £915,000 a year from the British taxpayer? The oh, gentleman seems to know a lot about these ducal matters. <laughs> Most interesting. I'm fascinated by the reply. Let's hear it. Prime Minister. When we, uh, one of the tasks that we do, will have, and the uh, honourable gentleman is right, when we leave the European Union, is to decide what support is provided to agriculture as a result of being outside the common agricultural policy. I can assure him that we are taking the interests of all parts of the United Kingdom into account when we look at that system and what it should be in the future. Ah, yeah. oh, yes, a Hampshire knight, I think, Sir Gerald Howarth. Yeah. Uh, Last weekend, our right honourable friend, uh, the Secretary of State for Defence, made a very welcome visit uh, to Ukraine where he said freedom and democracy are not tradable commodities. As we mark the 25th anniversary of relations between our two parliaments, can I uh, invite my right honourable friend to declare the support of the United Kingdom, the continuing support of the United Kingdom, for the maintenance of an independent sovereign state in Ukraine? which has been subjected to the most outrageous annexation of part of its property by Russia. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm very happy to join my honourable friend in confirming our commitment to that independent sovereign state of the Ukraine. The Foreign Secretary has been doing a lot of work with, uh, with other uh, foreign ministers on this particular issue. We do provide significant support to Ukraine, and I hope soon to be able to meet President Poroshenko and to talk about the support that we provide. Pat McFadden. Last <laughs> week. The Prime Minister said that Parliament would get a vote on the final deal between the UK and the European Union. <laughs> Could she set out for the House what would happen if Parliament said no to the terms of that deal? Would she, in those circumstances, negotiate an alternative deal? Or would her no deal option mean falling back on World Trade Organisation rules, which mean 10% tariffs on cars? 20% on food and drink, and a host of other barriers to trade, investment and prosperity in the UK. Prime Minister. As I also said in my speech last uh, week, I expect that we are going to be able to negotiate a good deal in terms of trade with the European Union, because it will be our in, in our in 
it will be in our interests and those of the European Union as well. There will be a vote on the deal for this Parliament, uh, but then uh, if, there is a, if this Parliament is not willing to accept a deal that has been uh, decided and agreed by the uh, United Kingdom Government with the European Union, I have said that if there is no deal, then we do have to fall back on other arrangements. Graham Evans. Mr Speaker, it is a great pleasure to welcome my, friend, my honourable friend, the Prime Minister, and her Cabinet to SciTech Darsbury earlier this week. And I welcome the Government's industrial strategy, which will bring high-skill, high-wage jobs that will help close the North-South divide. And the message is that Britain is open for business. Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, I, I thank my honourable friend. And I and the whole Cabinet were very pleased to be able to visit Darsbury. I was pleased to be able to sit down uh, and meet with small businesses on that uh, particular site and to hear the support they have for what the government is doing in the industrial strategy. We should be very clear, Britain is open for business. We will be out there trading around the world, a leader, global leader in free trade, bringing jobs, economic growth and prosperity to every part of this country. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We're all aware of the hundreds of thousands of women around the world that marched on behalf of women's rights last weekend. Of course, in this House, we have been lobbied by members of the Women Against State Pension Inequality. Many MPs have lodged petitions asking the Government to act. Can the Prime Minister tell us how many MPs have lodged such petitions? Prime Minister. I have to say to the, uh, to the Honourable Gentleman that I think the number of petitions presented in this Parliament is a matter for the House authorities. But what he also knows is that the Government has also has already taken action in relation to the uh, issue of women's pensions to reduce the uh, changes that will be uh, uh, experienced by women and putting extra money into that. John Barron. Following her excellent EU speech last week, will the Prime Minister consider unilaterally guaranteeing the rights of EU citizens living and working in the UK. This isn't just the decent thing to do, but by taking the moral high ground, this will be a source of strength going forward in the negotiations, and we can always return to the issue of non-reciprocation by the EU, if necessary, later in those negotiations. Well, Prime Minister! I recognise the concern that my hon. Friend has raised in relation to this issue. Um, but my position remains the same as it always has been. Uh, I expect and intend and want to be able to guarantee the rights of EU citizens living here in the United Kingdom. But as the British Prime Minister, it is only right that I should give consideration to the rights of UK citizens living elsewhere in the 27 remain, what will be the remaining 27 member states of the EU. And that's why I want that reciprocal arrangement. But I, as I said in my speech last week, I remain open to this being an issue that we negotiate at a very early stage in the negotiation. I think there are a good number of other European member states who want that too. Right. Some don't, but I'm hoping that we will be able to do this at an early stage. Yeah. Dr Lisa Cameron. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Mr Speaker. As chair of the all-party parliamentary group for disability, we recently compiled an important inquiry report into the government's pledge to half the disability employment gap. Research shows that this pledge will not be met for 50 years. To date, no minister has met with the APPG to discuss the report. Will the Prime Minister place people with disability at the heart of policy and ensure that her ministers engage with the APPG and its recommendations? Yeah. 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 The, the Honourable Lady raises an important issue about the question of disabled people in the workplace. It is one that we are aware of. Of course, as we see the number of people in uh, uh, unemployment going down, then it does change the ratios uh, uh, to an extent. But the, the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions is looking very seriously at this issue of how we can ensure that we are uh, seeing more people who are disabled people uh, actually in the workplace. And I'm sure he will see the requests that she has made in relation to the APPG. Yeah. So David Can I yeah, wel yeah. welcome the Prime Minister meeting with the President of Turkey? on Saturday, when we can show our solidarity in the fight against terrorism, we can deepen our trading relationship, and can the Prime Minister also seek support for a united and independent Cyprus free from Turkish troops? Uh, I thank my honourable friend for raising that. There are important issues that I will be discussing with President Erdogan and with uh, uh, the Prime Minister of Turkey when I meet them on Saturday. Uh, he raises the issue of Cyprus. I am hopeful that, we can, that the talks will be able to continue to come to a solution. I think we are closer to a solution than we have been before. I have already spoken both to Prime Minister Tsipras and to President Erdogan about uh, the need to ensure that we are creative in the thinking and finding a solution for this. And I had a uh, further 
telephone call with Nikos Anastasiades over the weekend about this very issue. We stand ready as a guarantor to play our part in ensuring we can see a successful conclusion of these talks and see that reunification of Cyprus, which people have been working for for some time. Mr Nigel Dodds. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I um, join the Prime Minister in wishing a speedy recovery to the police officer who was shot and injured in my constituency in North Belfast on Sunday night. Thankfully, he was not killed, but that was not the intention of the terrorists, of course. It is very clear, Mr Speaker, that the uh, political instability brought about by Sinn Féin's collapse of the Assembly is in no one's interest in Northern Ireland. It is also clear that their intention is to try to rewrite the history of the past. Will she make it very clear that the one-sided legal persecution of police officers and soldiers who did so much to bring peace to Northern Ireland will not be allowed to continue? Prime Minister. I say to the right honourable gentleman that, as he indicates, the political stability in Northern Ireland has been hard-earned over some considerable time, and none of us want to see that thrown away. He raises the issue of the current situation, where there are a number of uh, investigations by the PSNI into former soldiers and their activities in Northern Ireland. I think it is absolutely right that we recognise that the uh, majority of people who lost their lives lost their lives as a result of terrorist activity, and it is important that that terrorist activity is looked into. That is why one of the issues that my right hon. Friend, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland is looking at is this uh, legacy question and how that issue of investigation uh, 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 on all sides can take place in the future. Maggie Throop. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. 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 Social care provided by Labour led Derbyshire County Council is failing miserably, with serious errors in process leading to, quite frankly, shameful consequences for some of my most vulnerable constituents. This is clearly not about funding, as they sit on reserves of about £233 million. Will my right honourable friend instigate an urgent review of social care practice at the County Council, because the people of Derbyshire deserve better? Prime Minister. My, my honourable friend has made an important point in relation to this issue, which is that success of social care is not wholly about funding. It is about actually the practice on the ground. And that is why we are very clear that it is important to see that integration between social and health care at a local level, and local authorities should be playing their part in delivering that. Uh, and we, this is an issue that we need to see addressed for the longer term as well. Frankly, it's been ducked by governments for too long in this country, and that's why this government is determined to bring forward a sustainable uh, programme for social care in the future. Ed Miliband. Yeah. Br it, br it, it brings... Br it. <laughs> right honourable gentleman, never knew he was quite that popular. Yeah. Ed Miliband. I, I was going to say, Mr Speaker, it, it brings back memories, actually. <laughs> Uh, can I say to the Prime Minister that, as the first foreign leader to meet President Trump, she carries a huge responsibility on behalf not just of this country but the whole international community in the tone that she sets? Can I ask her to reassure us that she will say to the President that he must abide by and not withdraw from the Paris Climate Change yeah, Treaty? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in case it is helpful, can she offer the services of UK scientists to convince the President that climate change is not a hoax invented by the Chinese? Yeah. Prime Minister! Well, I recognise the, uh, the role that the Right Honourable Gentleman has played in, in uh, looking at this issue of climate change, and the, I hope he recognises the commitment that this Government has shown to this issue of climate change, with the legislation that we have put through uh, and the changes that we have uh, brought about in terms of the energy sector and uses of different forms of energy. Um, the, American, the Obama administration obviously signed up to the uh, Paris Climate Change Agreement. We have now done that. I would hope that all parties would uh, continue to ensure that that climate change agreement is put into practice. Order. Well, 45 minutes after it started, Prime Minister's questions comes uh, to an end. It looks like the Speaker has now decided that PMQ should be 45 minutes rather than 30, since that seems the standard time. Uh, Prime Minister began taking a kind of planted question from a Tory backbencher to announce that there will be a white paper on the government's Brexit position. Uh, something that we had kind of indicated uh, was likely to happen uh, before we went to PMQs. This 
probably took a bit of the wind out of the sails of Jeremy Corbyn because I suspect he was about to ask about that. And uh, he therefore changed tack, I think, and started to talk about um, would we be prepared to pay um, to secure tariff-free access to the European single market. He went on uh, to Nissan, was it revaluating its investments in Britain? And then about the bargain basement Britain, which has become a, a, a favourite phrase of Labour and of Mr Corbyn. Uh, the Prime Minister then quoted Sadi Khan, the uh, Labour Mayor of London, saying he didn't think the government was going to uh, undermine workers' rights, which uh, you had heard on this programme first, but there you go. Hmm. Uh, it was repeated at uh, <laughs> Prime Minister's questions. Uh, uh, and uh, Mr Corbyn then continues to go on about threats to workers' rights, even though the Saudi having had to deal with a surprise white paper, he then had to deal with the unhelpful quote from the Labour Mayor of uh, London uh, on that. And um, while we were doing PMQs, the um, Labour Party's been in touch uh, to say that I'd said earlier that the one statement was withdrawn uh, yesterday and replaced with another. Now, this is what actually happened, and you can decide. Uh, at 9.43, a statement was issued by Mr Corbyn's office. It included, Labour will seek to build in the principles of full tariff-free access to the single market and maintenance of workers' rights and social and environmental protections. Mr Corbyn himself, through his office, at 10.16, half an hour later, then made what was in effect an identical statement, but did not include these words about full tariff-free access uh, on that. Now, whether the, the first statement was withdrawn or simply superseded by the second statement, I'll leave you to make up your mind. But we're happy to clarify that's what happened. What did they make of PMQ? The Guardian, by the way, has said that this was the Prime Minister's best PMQ since she became Prime Minister. Well, at the risk of repetition of some of what you have said, um, there was an echo of much of your summary there in the emails that came in. From Martin Bristow, it was as if the daily politics had a crystal ball. <laughs> PMQs today saw the confirmation that we will have a cut and paste white paper. Well, that's one prediction we got right then. Um, Ian, <laughs> Ian Whiteley said the worst session of PMQs that Jeremy Corbyn has had. His attack was blunted by a Tory planted question on the white paper. It was then destroyed completely when Mrs May used Sadiq Khan, the London Mayor's quote, to shoot down his claims. And Andrew says, uh, Mrs May declaring a white paper on Brexit seemed to completely flummox Jeremy Corbyn and he didn't seem to be able to respond. He had a scattergun approach on various subjects with no question hitting home. In general, they felt it wasn't uh, a Prime Minister's questions okay. that Jeremy Corbyn did well in. So, a white paper. A white paper and uh, a climb, climb down for the government. I mean, just mm. yesterday in the House, David Davis, the Brexit Secretary, said basically it would be too difficult to do it in the timescale. Mm. Why and have they climbed down, do you think? Well, I think that there are two parts to this. One is it's clever politically because it takes off one of the likely amendments to the bill that could have garnered some support mm. before the bill is even out. So it avoids mm. a potential defeat next week. Second of all, I just wonder if having seen to be pretty consistently sort of taking more of the side of the Brexiteers in the Tory party, mm. it was felt perhaps that it was time to give some kind of gesture to those to them. the other Because the Brexiteers have won most of the arguments, they didn't they? Most of the in arguments. the run up to Mrs May's Indeed. speech. And they were cock a hoop after the Lancaster House speech. There's absolutely mm -hmm. no question yeah. about that. But I think also, given that late last night Brexiteers were being told there won't be a white paper, early this morning the sense and number 10 was they were happy with it up their sleeve but they weren't ready to reveal it mm. today this is a last minute change of heart yeah. and one senior Tory has just said to me welcome to the vacillation of the next two years this is a very fluid a situation process. very fluid indeed so you knew the change was a coming why did the government change its mind on a white paper well, as, as I said earlier on, I think it's been very clear. We've been very open about it. This is an issue about process that in Westminster people get very excited about. Mm -hmm. But as I said to you earlier on, I think generally your viewers, people out there, really mm -hmm. just want to see us getting on with delivering the plan the Prime Minister outlined. Yep. And that's what the government... So why did you change your mind? to be? 
Well, there's a bad change in our mind. I you think the government's been very clear. No, no, no. David Davis said in the House it would be too difficult well, I, to do I, it in the time. I think it also, but also be very clear there will be a continual debate. The government will continue to look at this to make sure everybody can feed right. in and have their say. But this is just part of that look, process. The, the Prime Minister's decided I, to make I'm, it clear she's going to I understand all that, but let me just bring you back to the question for one last forlorn <laughs> attempt. <laughs> Yesterday, David Davis told the House that it would be too difficult to produce a white paper. 24 hours later, less than, uh, the Prime Minister says there's going to be a white paper. What changed? Well, I think it's very, very, very simple in that the fact that the David Davis's team, the Brexit Department and the Prime Minister, have listened to what people in the House of Commons say. We should welcome the fact that the government is listening to what people are saying, responding to that. But again, I come back to the core point with this. is This is a process thing that we in Westminster sometimes get very excited no, about. I understand what that. You've made that what people are interested point. in is delivering on Brexit and the plan that the Prime Minister clearly outlined so, at Lancaster So House. David Davis came away from the Commons yesterday and thought, Oh, these were really strong arguments for a white paper. When I said there was no time for a white paper, that was really the stupid thing to say. Let's have a white paper. That's what, what you're what, telling what, me. What the Prime Minister has outlined today is that we're going to publish a white paper. That better have a chance to see I'm that. I'm just trying to find we'll out why you changed that, your that mind. That will be delivered as we go forward. And it's just about delivering the right thing of the British people okay. and doing it in a way that people can understand. I'm puzzled by Jeremy Corbyn's question to the Prime Minister about would she be prepared to pay... Uh, to secure tariff-free access, because we, the Prime Minister has said we won't be a member of the single market anymore, a member, but she wants to do the best possible free trade deal. But free trade deals do not avoid, uh, involve paying for access. So why does he ask that question? Well, it's interesting because in response to a question in uh, Brexit questions, a few weeks ago, David Davis said that the government were considering that. So, um, no, he didn't a, say a, for the tariff. He didn't be... talk about that to secure access. He talked about there would be certain programs that me, we may wish to continue with. I think Erasmus may have been one. He mentioned other ones where you do have to pay a kind of membership fee to get in. That's different from paying a generalised fee for access to the single market. So I say again. Free trade deals, and I've seen quite a few, the most recent one with Canada and the EU, free trade deals by definition do not involve paying for access to another market. Well, I stand to be corrected, Andrew, but I think that that was what David Davis said a few weeks ago. But let me uh, answer the question you Maybe asked he Brandon, that mind. he was struggling with. <laughs> I mean, Maybe he changed his mind. Well, he's changed his mind quite a lot at the moment, isn't he? Because the, the question that Brandon was struggling with is clear. Uh, Theresa May recognised after yesterday's debate she was facing defeat on what was Labour's First Amendment. And you asked me earlier what bringing grip to the process meant. Um, Theresa May didn't want to concede a vote to the House of Commons. She's been forced to give one. She didn't want to publish a white paper. She's mm. been forced to give one. This is the sort of grip that Labour's trying to bring to the process by raising these issues. Just finally, Laura, I would suggest that uh, she wasn't frightened of losing if she didn't produce a white paper. But this does make it easier for her. Oh, no question, because this was one of the amendments that people mm. on, from all parties were able yeah. to gather around. Mm. With this now off the table, it's quite hard to see what they might be able to come up mm. with next. And I think in the big picture, what we've seen really in the last couple of weeks is a sense that people on the Remain side of the argument are really actually struggling to come up with concrete, convincing mm. ways that they can actually try to nail the government down. Okay. And I think that that certainly has been a feature. It's one of the interesting right. things before Christmas, after the High Court decision, the government was very right. much on the back foot. Theresa May's got onto the front foot this time. We should keep a scorecard of these changes now and mm -hmm. do them on the big board. Yeah. Very interesting. <laughs> no, I'm going to have to, so because we want to squeeze another item in. I'm sorry. Laura, thank you very much. Pleasure. That's all, folks.